Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Faith prepares. Faith is persuaded of the good things that the Lord has said. But then uh, faith without works, as we've read recently, is, is dead, in, inoperative, doesn't produce. So faith is not only persuaded, but faith prepares. Say it out loud, faith prepares. Faith prepares. I just had the sense just a few moments ago, just a reminder from the Lord, you know, good things are happening. Uh, you, you can see some things, you know, we're preparing big time down in Sarasota. We got some things uh, we're ready to, to advance here as well. We, we talked about some of them on Vision Sunday. And uh, you don't want to just wait uh, until you see if something's going to come up where you can work or where you can fit or where you can do something. Faith prepares. Amen. Things are going on. Things are coming up. And you know who will get called? Who will get used? Those, huh? Who need to get ready. Huh? Those who thought about getting ready. Those who were intending to. Meaning to get, no, no. You, you know the story of the... Uh, uh, the virgins, that some uh, were prepared and some were not, and uh, the Lord came, and those that were ready uh, and came prepared, they went in, and those who were out trying to get ready, they missed out. So we don't want to do that. What, what are we saying? Well, whatever the Lord's dealing with you about, if it's sin, get rid of it. If it, lay aside every, every weight and the sin that hinders you and besets you. If you're uh, burdened down with a bunch of debt and a bunch of stuff and, and you have to just work night and day just to service your debts, you're believing God to get, get out of that. Get, get it paid off. Get, get it done. Where your, your, your resources are freed up, your time is freed up. The Lord's dealing with you to do some extra praying and reading. Do it. Do it. Get rid of some habits. Amen. Get some things straightened up. Prepare. Faith gets ready. Faith prepares. It doesn't wait till something happens and then, okay, well, I, I, no, you're too late then. No, do what the Lord says, and if we obey every day, we'll be ready always. Won't we? Because the Lord is, you know, He's always preparing you. And if He deals with us to do something, there's a reason why. He knows what's coming up, and if we'll trust Him, we'll be ready. Amen. We'll be ready. Amen. So just uh, whatever the Lord's dealing with you about, don't put it off. Go ahead, get to it, get on it, and then when these things, uh, not if they unfold, when. They're, they're happening and they're coming. And there, there's uh, uh, the Lord... If he had his way, nobody would be collecting dust on the shelf. Because this is a big job. The harvest is great and the laborers are few. And we, we need everybody we've got doing everything they can. And we need millions more saved and coming into the kingdom doing their job to get this thing done. It is global. It is huge. It is eternal. And we're not just down here to get up and go to work and wash clothes and shampoo our hair and do it again tomorrow. Come on now. There's a bigger thing going on here. We're here for a few days. And, and we're, we're come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And we've got something to offer. You've got something in you. Whether it's been fully developed or not, you have graces and gifts in you. And there's a place where it fits. And if you'll get ready, if you'll keep believing... Do everything you know, there'll come a time when it'll open up and you'll be ready, right place, right time. Hallelujah. And you'll, you'll say, this is what I was born for. This is what, and there is nothing better in life. Nothing better in life than doing what you're created to do. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Did you bring your Bible this morning? <coughs> Excuse me, turn to James. <coughs> Excuse me, James 3. James 3 and Proverbs 18. If you didn't bring a Bible, hold up your hand. The ushers have extra Bibles. You can use one of ours, and, and, and everybody, 
Go to James 3, Proverbs 18, please. The church has had three, three mark-offs on the vision list just in the past few days. One was the paying of the Believer's Victory Campaign in Branson. The church underwrote that entirely. Somebody say glory to God. Glory to God. And then also, uh, we'd been believing, you know, for uh, television upgrades. And so the church sowed a significant seed into their high definition uh, project in their seed. And so we're believing now, aren't we? We've, we've sown others as well, but we're believing to be able to upgrade ours at the proper time. And um, we're, we, we need some links and stuff too between our churches, don't we? So we can do things and do it in a top-notch fashion. So the HD uh, prices have actually come down some. It's, you know, like computers, they're always coming out with something new and the prices begin to drop. But uh, we will be able to upgrade and have everything we need in that area. And then also the third mark off is the hangar. I mean, that's been on our vision list for years. And now we got it and it's, it's done. Thank you, Lord. Now, how many got some seed in some of those projects? One or, or all of them? Well, are you believing for a harvest? Everything produces after its own kind. Like just the hangar seed, for instance. I mean, you know, there ought to be folks in faith uh, believing for their garages, their shops, Amen. their warehouses, Amen. hangers, Amen. Uh, whatever, everything produces, or if it's your business, a better building, or uh, and, and the plane is equipment, Amen. and top-notch equipment, and you know, maybe you're not believing for a plane, maybe you are, but you're believing for something that's top-notch in your area of, of where you work, and uh, the Bible said if you're willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. The best, the top-notch stuff that, that they're coming out with nowadays. And a lot of these things can help you save time and save effort and combine your um, jobs, you know, that took this can be reduced down to less time and less effort. Are you in faith? Are you in faith? Yes. Somebody say, I'm in faith. I'm in faith. I'm believing for a harvest. I'm believing for a harvest. Okay. James 3, verse 2 says, in many things we offend all, if any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. The NIV says, if anyone is never at fault in what he says, he's a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. He goes on talking about how we control horses with the bit. They control ships, even though they're out on the, the big waves of the ocean and driven with fierce winds with a relatively small rudder. And he says what the bit is to the horse, what the rudder is to the ship, your tongue, your mouth is to your life. I think if he'd have been writing it today, he might have included the steering wheel, you know, because that's, that's what controls the direction of the car or the truck. So... Is it true that our words are steering our life? Yes. Hmm? Yes. You, it, it's obvious most Christians, most people in general, don't believe this. Why would you say that, Brother Keith? Because of the way they talk. It's obvious. If you believed what you're saying is either helping you or hurting you, it's ministering life to you or death to you, it's, it's making you sick or it's healing you. It's bringing money to you or it's keeping it away from you. If you really believed that, you would watch what you said, wouldn't you? And if you don't, if you just say whatever you feel like, whatever everybody else is saying, it proves you don't believe it. But it's working. Whether you believe it bad or believe it good, it's working. But smart people say good things and get good things. Uh, did you notice he said there, if you don't miss it in what you say, you're a perfect man. That, that doesn't mean flawless. It means fully developed, completely developed. Uh, what if you were missing it, uh, you know, once, 
once every couple of hours in what you say, well, you're not very perfected. You not you hadn't been developed too much. And what if you get to where you just miss it in what you say once a month? You've grown a bunch, right? What if you get where you go six months and not miss it in what you say? Can you see what's happening? You are, you are being developed. You're being perfected. And if you do that, you can control your whole life. He mentioned specifically here, you can keep your whole body in check. Is it true? You can control things about your body with what you say. Is it true? Go to Luke 4, please. Luke 4, notice this. Luke, the fourth chapter, the Bible said Jesus came and uh, verse... Uh, 38, Luke 4, 38, he arose out of the synagogue, entered into Simon's house, Peter's house. Simon, Peter's wife's mother, was taken with a great fever, and they besought him for her. Now, nowadays, if somebody has a high fever, what do most Christians think about? Huh? Somebody said Tylenol. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> Tylenol, bear, something. Right? That's usually the first thing and a lot of times the only thing. What did Jesus do? Somebody needs to get this woman some Tylenol. <laughs> huh? <laughs> Because this fever is, whew, it's off the chart here. She, Luke was a doctor, and he said she had a great fever. She's not just running a few degrees. Uh, this leaves the implication she's delirious with fever. She's in a, in a bad way here. And the Bible said that Jesus stood over her, verse 39, he stood over her. Come, come on, do you see the picture now? Peter's wife's mother's laid out, delirious with fever. Jesus comes up by the bed. He stands over her. And what did he do? He what did he do? He In this, he rebuked the fever. Is he praying for her? He's not praying for her. Is he talking to her? He's not talking to her. He's talking to a fever. Now, I remember years ago reading that and it dawning on me and then Jesus is talking to a fever. And I thought, can fevers hear? Can a fever hear? See, we, we haven't thought like that. We weren't brought up being taught this kind of thing. But this is the way it's always been. And this is the way Jesus taught us to live and operate. Everything that exists came into existence by spoken words. It shouldn't be a thing thought strange to us that it could be altered by spoken words or changed because that's what brought it into existence to begin with. And in fact, everything is upheld continuously by the word of his power. Jesus rebuked the fever. I thought, can a fever hear? Jesus spoke to the wind. He spoke to waves. He spoke to trees. He spoke to fevers. I read the rest of the verse. It said he rebuked the fever and it left her. I thought, yep, fevers can hear. Fevers can hear. And then I had revelation. I thought if a fever can hear, high blood pressure can hear. Tumors can hear. Cancers can hear. Come on, are you listening to me? And you begin to see how what he's talking about in James, if you get a hold of what you say, you can control your body. Amen. If a fever can hear, a liver can hear. Amen. A lung can hear. Glands can hear. Joints can hear. Nerves can hear. Blood cells can hear. Amen. But the church has lost this. By and large, it's been replaced by tradition. And some people even scoff at folk like you and me and think, well, you know, who do they think they are? 
And they, they, they said, well, Jesus could do that. He's the Son of God. Yes, but the Scripture tells us He did it as a man, Amen. anointed by the Spirit. And He taught us to do it. You remember when He spoke to that fig tree and it withered away. And they remarked and said, Lord, look how soon the fig tree is withered away. And He said in Matthew 21, He said, if you would have faith and not doubt, you could not only do this which is done to the fig tree. Somebody needs to see that verse. Put it up on the screen for us. Matthew 21. Was it 21, 22? Or 21? Yeah, 21, 21. Thank you. Matthew 21, 21. He said, if you have faith, and uh, he's talking to his disciples, if you have faith, if who has faith? You. Not him, them. Are we his disciples too? Are we his followers too? If you have faith and doubt, doubt not, you shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree. Whoa, whoa, stop. Is he saying they could have done what he just did? Yes. Is he? Yes. You shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if you say to this mountain. He said it'll, it'll not just work on a tree. You not him, not him, them, yes. you could say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and it shall be done. People say, oh, you got to be kidding me. You got, you're going to talk to a mountain and it's going to remove into the sea. Right. Well, not for you because <laughs> you don't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> but if you believed it, go back to what he said, if you had faith and if you didn't doubt, you'd, you'd have what you said. Do we believe this? Yes. Tradition and religion has robbed people of this. But let's get back to the ways of the master. Let's do what he did. What does it mean to be a Christian, a Christian, one like the Christ? Are we supposed to pray like he prayed? Live like he lived, yes. think like he thought, yes. walk like he walked, yes. talk like he talked. Yes. Are we? Yes. Well, he talked to trees. Yes. He talked to fevers. Yes. He talked to the wind and the waves, and they obeyed him. Yes. Now, granted, you know, I'm not saying that we're necessarily talking on the same level that he talked about, but we ought to start somewhere. Yes. Right? Yes. Well, I don't know if I'm ready to talk to a mountain. Well, how about talking to your toe? <laughs> Get your mind off the mountain. That may not be your problem anyway. <laughs> huh? Talk to your money to come in to pay your bills. Talk to what, deal with what you're dealing with, and as your faith grows, you'll come up. But you scoff, you make fun, you make excuses. Well, you'll live like the unsaved world does, with absolutely no power in your words at all. Proverbs 20, or 18, excuse me. 18 and 20, if you're holding that place still. A man's belly will be satisfied with, with the fruit of his mouth, and with the increase of his lips shall he be filled. If you want things to increase, if you want to be full, if you want to have abundance, it doesn't start in your pocketbook. It doesn't start in your bank account. Hmm? It starts in your mouth, doesn't it? Talk increase. What's happening in this year, 2011, for you and your business and your house? What's happening? We are increasing in every good thing. It's going well with us. We have favor with God and man. Hmm? Speak. The other people don't have to hear everything you say. You can say things in your car on the way to work. You can say things by yourself when you're getting ready in the mornings in your bathroom. You say, you know, uh, buyers, come to me. People are going to buy this stuff from somebody somewhere today. They might as well come get it from me. We're not talking about tire kickers. We're talking about buyers. Hmm? So watch what you say. Watch what you say. Very, very simple about words, verbs, 
that are present and future tense versus past tense. If you keep saying, man, these people just keep wasting my time, keep wasting my time. No, don't say that. If you want to say they wasted my time, Okay, but if you say they keep wasting my time, they always waste my time, you're prophesying. You're speaking over your future. Watch this, saints. Watch this closely. Well, it all, this always happens, and, and, and they, they, they're always doing this. Watch these present tense verbs, the, these future and present tense things that you're saying, because it's a subtle way of the enemy keeping you locked into a problem. Because if you say it keeps happening, then you are looping it. Anybody know what I mean by looping it? Why? Because the devil has a right to bring in nine people to waste your time. Because you said it. <laughs> if it looks like four people wasted half your time last week, if you want to say anything about it, put it in the past tense. Even if it was five minutes ago. Past tense. It happened, but what's the good of talking about it a lot anyway? What you need to say is, as I, my time is not wasted. Even when it looks and feels like it was, that's all the more reason to begin to say, no, the Lord orders my steps. He directs my paths. He orders my days. Everything I put my hand to prospers. I do not labor in vain. Things go well for me. The Lord prospers my way. Amen. Amen. So important that we watch our mouths in these areas. He went on to say in 1821, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Do we believe this? Does it matter what's coming out of our mouth? Yes. How much does it matter? It's a matter of death and life, our life and death. What we're saying, everything that's coming out of our mouth is either helping us or it's hurting us. It's either healing us or it's making us sick. It's either keeping money and provision away from us or it's calling it and drawing it to us. So if we're smart, we will cut out everything that's hurting us. And no matter, You'll be tempted to say the wrong thing. Oh, you will. But bite your lip. And if you catch yourself having said the wrong thing, change it. Say something else and go, no, 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 I said that, but I don't believe that. And that's not what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen. All you got to do is straighten it out. And then stay consistent with, with the good thing. Now, uh, let me see. Let, go with me to Joshua 10, and I will read a couple of verses on our way there. You go to Joshua 10, and I want to read to you Job 22, 28. We'll wind up in Joshua 10. But Job 22, 28, if you'd put it up on the screen for us. It says, you shall also decree a thing, and it shall be established unto you, and the light shall shine upon your ways. Read that out loud with me, friends. You shall also decree a thing, and it shall be established unto you, and the light shall shine upon your way. Should we be decreeing some things? Yes, we should. In Isaiah 57, 19, you don't have to turn there, but they'll put it up for us. Isaiah 57, 19, the Lord says, I create the fruit of the lips. Peace, peace to him that is far off and to him that is near, says the Lord, and I will heal him. Glory. Does him healing you have anything to do with what's coming out of your lips? What does he create in your life? Not just what he said.
The fruit of the lips, what you say. Now we've already seen this, and this is uh, definitely kicking over some sacred cows. <laughs> but they need to be. Uh, we saw what happened with the Israelites that God delivered out of Egyptian bondage. God had said, I have found a land for you. I, I have selected it from all lands. And it's a land that flows with milk and honey. And he talked about bringing them into it. And the Hebrew says it was his plan for them to come in and enjoy that from the foundation of the world. But that first generation did not enjoy it. And the Bible said, it came to a point where they kept saying, God said, I've given you the promised land. They kept saying, we're going to die in the wilderness. What was God's will? Enjoy, enter into, possess, enjoy the promised land. That's what he had said. That's what his will is. What they say? We're going to die in the wilderness. So what did he do for them? It came to a point where he told them, I'm going to do for you what you said out of your own mouth. And they died in the wilderness. Even though it wasn't the plan of God and it was contrary to the words God had said over them. This is the thing we need mind renewal about. Your words, your words coming out of your mouth and mine, they carry more weight in your life than anybody else's, including God's. Now that's the thing that slaps religion in the face. Folk go, oh, what? We just got through giving you an example. What if a person, their sins have already been carried by Jesus? He's already, the, the blood on the mercy seat pronounces them innocent by faith in Jesus, holy, clean, sanctified, but they say, no, I don't believe it and I don't accept it. Whose words carry in their life? And this is life and death, heaven and hell. No, friends. If you say something contrary to what he said, you're going to get not what he said, but what you said. But if you're smart, I said if you're smart, you will say what he said and only what he said and then he'll be able to do for you what you said, which was what he said. <laughs> Are y'all with me, friends? If you'll say what he said, he'll do what you say. No matter how we feel, no matter what's going on in our life, we should say, if he says you're righteous, you should say, I'm right. No matter what you feel or what it looks like, if he says you're clean, you say, I'm clean. If he says you're holy, you say, I'm holy. If he says you're healed, you say you're healed. If he says he supplies all your needs, you say he supplies all my needs. No matter what you see, what you feel, you won't say anything else. And if you'll say what he said, he'll do what you say. <laughs> Glory. You believe this, saints? It's the word of God. It's true. The Bible tells us that uh, everything in existence came into existence by the word of God. Uh, Psalm 33, 6 says, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. We're created in his likeness and image, and we must learn to live like he has given us example, how Jesus has given us example. And instead of just saying things to express ourselves which is what most people on the planet, all words are to them, is a means of communication, a way to express how I, f how I feel, what I think. But it was never intended to just be that. When God speaks, He doesn't just comment on things. When He speaks, things change. 
Right? Yes. He doesn't just remark about it. He remakes it when he says something. And we could begin operating. Now, granted, I don't, none of us are ready to speak any worlds into existence. But like I said, let's start where we are. Let's begin speaking over even the small things in our life and begin learning how to release our faith because the time's coming, child of God, that you and I will be responsible to rule and reign throughout eternity with them. How are you going to do this? You shall decree a thing. And it'll be established when a king wants a ditch dug, he doesn't look for a shovel. <laughs> Does he? He says, let the ditch be dug. <laughs> right? And that's how he gets things done is by decreeing it, by saying it. That's how the God the Father operates. That's how the King of Kings operates. And that's how the kings he's king of are supposed to operate. And you see examples of it through the scriptures that here and there a man or a woman tapped into this and saw amazing things happen. Here's one of those examples. Joshua 10. Joshua is leading the people of God into the promised land that the first generation said you couldn't go into. <laughs> Just because a group said it couldn't be done doesn't mean it can't be done. They are taking the walled cities and they are conquering the giants that that previous generation said were too big and too much and couldn't be done. And they've had some miraculous victories and overcome more than one city and, and group. And now the enemy is scared and rattled by them, so they are combining forces. And now five kings and their armies combine together to stop this advance of Joshua and the people of God to conquer them and to destroy them. And in Joshua 10 and verse uh, 5, those five kings of the Amorites it talks about, they went up and all their hosts, all their armies, and they encamped before Gibeon and made war against it. Gibeon had entered into covenant with Joshua and the people of God and called for their help. And verse 7, Joshua ascended from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said to Joshua, Fear them not. What's the first thing he told them? Do you reckon it's important whether they get afraid of them or not? Of all the things he could have told them, if it wasn't important, if it didn't matter if they're scared or not, do you think he'd have said this? So this must be something that could hinder this from working. Fear them not, for I have delivered them into your hand. There shall not a man of them stand before you. He's talking about five armies that are arrayed out there against them. And the Lord, first thing the Lord says, don't be scared. He's looking over five armies. Do not be afraid of them. I have already given them into your hand. There will not one of them be able to stand against you. And Joshua has had 40 years in the desert holding on to faith. He is not a man that will be shaken now. God tells him this, he's going to believe it. And he did, and they waded into him. And he went suddenly and came up to Gilgal all night, and the Lord discomfited them, verse 10, before Israel, slew them with a great slaughter at Gibeon, chased them along the way that goes up to Beth Horon, and smote them to Ezekiah and Makeda. And it came to pass, as they fled from before Israel, and were in the going down to Beth Horon, that the Lord cast down great stones from heaven upon them to Ezekiah. And they died, and there were more that died with hailstones than they whom the children of Israel slew with the sword. Now, now notice this, the enemy, of course this, this represents the devil, the, he's, he's the enemy, the enemy has combined forces, not doubled up five times, in a, con a concentrated, concerted assault on the people of God. Anytime the devil 
pulls out the stops and tries to do something big, you should start smiling. Because it gives God a right to do something big. God himself got involved and fired hailstones <laughs> at the enemy. <laughs> and that was wiping out more of the forces than their hand to hand was. <laughs> then spoke Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Son, Stand thou still upon Gibeon and moon in the valley of Ajalon and, and the sun stood still and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is not this written in the book of Yeshua? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hasted not to go down about a whole day. They were counting a day as the approximate 12 hours of daylight. So they had an additional 12 hours or so of daylight to what they normally had. And there was no day like that, before it or after it, that the Lord hearkened to the voice of a man. Say that out loud. The Lord hearkened to the voice of a man. Say it again. The Lord hearkened to the voice of a man. Glory to God. Do you believe this? Now this account in particular, along with a couple of others, are those most berated by so-called experts in science and those who claim to be experts and study the universe and, and what have you. This and stories like uh, Jonah being in the uh, belly of the great fish, or belly, I, you know, wherever he was. <laughs> but uh, people say, well, you know, that is absolutely ridiculous. The planets did not stop in their orbits, in their rotations, the sun did not stand still. And this shows the stupidity of it that they were thinking that the sun rotated around them and so then that proves how ignorant the Bible is. And if that part's wrong, why do you think other parts are, are, are right? Are y'all with me? There's a lot of people who say things like this and discount it. Now, now you'll find again and again, one of the things they do is they add things that the passage didn't say. And then they, they, they change it. For instance, they say, well, there, there's no way that a man could live in the belly of a whale. Didn't necessarily say it was a whale. It was a great fish. Well, ain't no way a, a man could live in the belly of a great fish. We don't know exactly where he was in the great fish. But uh, how would you know that? The Bible said the Lord prepared Amen. a great fish. Now, before you can be an expert on telling us how something can't happen and can't work, you would have to know something about how it works. And if you don't know how it works, how can you tell us how it can't work? Amen. Hmm? And in order for you to tell us what couldn't happen with a great fish, you'd have to know how to form a great fish. God creates fish from scratch. 
Everybody know what I mean by that? <laughs> and if you can make a fish, then you certainly could modify a fish. If you can make a fish, you can modify a fish. And before you tell us a fish can't be modified, you have to tell us how a fish is made. These so-called experts. Well, the same thing is true with this. Before you can tell us what can't happen with the rotation of the planets and, and the orbits, you'd have to be able to tell us how they came into orbit and what keeps them in orbit, where they came from. And outside of the Genesis account, and apart from what the Bible tells us about creation, which we're, we're not given the whole thing. We're given enough to believe it. But outside of that, everything else that is given in science journals and textbooks and you name it, is theory. Every one of them. Theory. Everybody say theory. theory. Do you know what theory is? Well, I wrote down the definition <laughs> so we'd be sure we knew. The theory of the Big Bang. The theory of creation. The theory of evolution. The theory. Theory. It's not even easy to say. Theory. What is a theory? A theory is a proposed explanation whose status is still conjectural. Conjectural means speculative, speculation. Now conjecture, conjectural, and speculative, those are big fancy words for a guess. <laughs> A guess. <laughs> Somebody guesses this is how it happened. I'm talking about the so-called brightest minds of the world. These are guesses. They, none, none of the stuff that they've written is proven. None of it. None of it. The Bible said the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. You want to understand something, it all starts with God. You're real. You made it. If you want to know, if you want to understand something, go to the person that invented it. Go to the manufacturer. They know. They made the thing. <laughs> Uh, look with me in Romans, the first chapter. We'll look in Romans 1, then we'll look in 1 Timothy 6. Romans 1 and 20. It says, For the invisible things of Him, of God, from the creation of the world are clearly seen, clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. God, the creator, has revealed himself in his creation. When you're looking up into the night sky, you're seeing God. When you look across the vast expanse of the Pacific Ocean and range of the Rocky Mountains, you are seeing God. You are seeing so much more than you know you're seeing. If you were able to discern it, you'd begin to understand even the Godhead, even the eternal power of God. You're looking at it. But if you don't believe in God, you're, you cannot see anything. You won't understand anything and you'll imagine yourself brilliant and you'll come up with a theory. 
which is an unfounded, unproven, unsubstantiated guess. Yes, but Brother Keith, it's an educated guess. <laughs> educated by who? Other guessers? <laughs> so you're an expert guesser. <laughs> Highly developed in guessing. Aren't you glad we don't have to live by a guess? No. Notice how many times in the scriptures it says, we know we've passed from death unto life because we love the rest. We know him in whom we have believed. We know, we know, we know. It's a good study. Just go through the New Testament. How many times it says, we know, we know, we know. Not we think so, we hope so, we're wondering about it. We have a theory. No, we know. And if the Bible said that Joshua said these words and it happened, then it happened. It happened. And before you tell us it can't happen, you got to tell us how the planets came into being and got started and got rotating. And if you ain't got a clue about that, then you're in no position to tell us what can't happen. <laughs> Is that all right? <laughs> Verse... 21, Romans 1, 21, because when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Ima became vain in their imaginations. Now, that's another word for theory. <laughs> they imagined something, and their foolish heart was darkened. Verse 22 professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And who is a fool but the man or woman that says there is no God? The psalmist talks about that. The fool has said in their heart, there is no God. That is a fool. Why? Because the fear of the Lord is the beginning. You don't even begin to know anything unless and until you reverence the Lord and acknowledge Him. Because all real knowledge comes from Him. Amen. All real understanding, all of it, Amen. comes from Him. Amen. In uh, 1 Timothy 6, 1 Timothy 6 and 20, he said, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to your trust, avoiding Profane and vain babblings. What's a vain babbling? Somebody goes on and on about something and it's not worth anything. It's vain. <laughs> Lord, give us discernment to recognize a vain babbling. <laughs> so babble, 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 babble. Yak, 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 yak. And you got thousand pages and 25 volumes and it all amounts to nothing. He said avoid it. Everybody say avoid it. Avoid it. Do you know how to avoid it? Change the channel. Go on down the road. Don't buy the book. Don't listen to it. Hmm? <laughs> avoid profane and vain babblings and what? Oppositions of science falsely so called. All true science acknowledges God and agrees with God. If it disagrees with God, it's a lie. I don't care how many people say it's right. It's not right. And it'll, it'll eventually be proven. But for them it may be too late. All true science, all true knowledge agrees with God. It would have to because all true knowledge and understanding comes from Him. Amen. Science falsely so called, verse 21, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Grace be with you. The, the complete English version says it like this, verse 20 and 21, don't pay any attention 
to that godless and stupid talk that sounds smart but really isn't. <laughs> have you heard any of that? Yes, you have. Verse 21, some people have even lost their faith by believing this talk. They have. It's sad. This, a lot of this stuff's taught in our schools. It's taught in our universities. And it's sad that some people that had some faith or the beginnings of some faith, and they listen to these people that, that present themselves as so intelligent and so knowledgeable and, and berate and run down the Bible and talk about all of us like we're pathetic and ignorant and don't have enough sense to realize that this stuff couldn't be and couldn't happen. And so they give their involved explanations of Theory. theories. But now they, 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 they don't like to, they might mention theory here and there, but after a while, they, they try to leave it like it's established fact. It's, it's just a, and it never was a fact. It was always a theory. And people have lost their faith. They have listened to these so-called experts and so-called people of knowledge and understanding and thought, well, you know, that's right. How could that be? And you know, they used to believe that, that the sun went around the earth, and that's probably what they're, he was doing there. And, and there ain't no way that, you know, and people, they, they back up and they use a different voice. And <laughs> If all the heavenly bodies in motion suddenly stopped, the consequences would bring global devastation. <laughs> it would just... Ain't nobody said they all stopped. See, that's what we're talking about. People will say, and a lot of Christians are so ignorant of the word, they'll just go, huh? Like they, it could not have stopped. The Bible didn't say it all stopped. Now, the Creator, I'm sure, He's the one set it in motion. If He wanted to stop it, if you know how to put it in motion, I reckon you know how to stop it. <laughs> I don't know why the Creator couldn't stop it and start it five times this afternoon if He wanted to. I don't know. But if you can start it, you can stop it. But it didn't say He stopped all the bodies in their rotations and their orbits. It didn't. Go back to the passage, Joshua 10. Joshua 10. Verse 12, Joshua shouted out, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon. Let's just stop right here. Is Joshua really interested in the rotations of the planet and the orbits in the solar system? No, no, no. What's he interested in? Time and daylight. He needs time, specifically daylight time. Because when it gets dark, this thing is going to change. And these five armies, if they don't take care of them, they're going to have to fight them again next week. Hmm? And God is moving for them. How many know when God's moving? Get her done. Right? I mean, stay with it till it's done. And God is obviously moving for them. And Joshua wants this thing done. And he looks up and he goes, why wow, we... This thing is going perfectly for us. But when the sun goes down and gets dark, all this is going to change. We got, I, got, I got to have time. I got to have time. And instead of saying, I need time, instead of begging, it came up in his heart. He looked up into the sky. He said, son, stay. Stand still. Moon. What's he talking about? This day needs to go on for me. And the Bible says, Verse 13, the sun stood still and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Keep reading. So the sun stood still. Now, now notice, he, he, uh, God is so smart. He knew that in centuries to come, there'd be stupid people that would try to say that this couldn't happen. 
And so he added some phrases. So the sun stood still where? Didn't say in its orbit, in its rotation, in the midst of heaven. Now he's talking about the sky. There are three heavens mentioned in the scripture. And the first heaven is the atmosphere. And in the second heaven is the uh, space beyond that. And in the third is, is where God is. But the sun stood still where? In the midst of the heaven. That's in the atmosphere where you, the, in the sky. In the earth sky, it, it looked like it didn't move. Not forever, but for the space of a whole day. It didn't stop. Things just slowed down and are changed. Now, I know next to nothing about the orbits and rotation of the planets. But even in my simplicity, I understand that the earth is tilted. That's why we have our seasons. Right now, the days are getting longer. Right? The days get longer. The days get short. That's happening all the time. The day is getting longer. The day, what happened here is the day got longer. Then it wasn't. This is happening all the time. There are places up, you know, north of the Arctic Circle, the sun shines for days. Right? Why is this such an incredible thing that people think could happen? I don't know. Maybe the Lord just tilted it just a little bit <laughs> and gave them an extra 12 hours, and then it just tilted right back. The earth is spinning about 1,000 miles an hour at the equator, and that affects us. And I reckon God could have just reached over and, with the throttles and pulled it back just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> and you get another 12 hours Amen. and then just push them back up with it <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how I know this if you can create it if you can set them in motion it's easy for you to do but the amazing thing is that God hearkened to the voice of a man right and whether it was rotation or tilting or what was involved, he gave him another 12 hours of daylight. And you know, what's Joshua going to ask for? Lord, I need a point zero zero seven five tilt <laughs> for X amount of hours. And here are the GPS coordinates that long. <laughs> no, he had no idea of what it was going to take to give him what he was asking for, and yet God gave it to him. And it blesses me because we don't have to know how, what it's going to take to get things done in our life. There'll be times when we're saying things, we're speaking to a, an organ or a bone, and we don't know, but God's going to have to recreate marrow cells. He's going to have to adjust, and he's going to have to quicken and reshape and reform. And a lot of things you may never even know this side, but it doesn't matter. Because we know him with whom nothing is too hard, nothing is impossible and if it comes up in our heart, now notice, it didn't say he did this once every year or two. We have no record that this ever happened again before or after that. And he wasn't trying to show that he had power and he could affect the heavens in daylight. No, no, no. He needed time. And he needed time to do what the Lord was leading him to do. And it affected the people of God. It affected the plan of God. And it came up in his heart and he said it and it happened. Glory to God. We're not talking about playing with things. We're not talking about trying things, experimenting with things. We're talking about having the concept that God spoke into the darkness and light became. And everything that exists came through his words, including us. And that we are not uh, 
We're not just animals. We're not even just angels. We are created in the family and likeness and image of God, speaking spirits like God. Is it true, saints? We are speaking spirits like God and have the ability to conceive and see, have vision and conceive something and see it within ourselves and believe it and speak it out of our mouth, it's God-like. It is our future. It is our present. Do you believe it, friends? We must take our words more seriously. And if we, you know, what do you believe happens when you speak? If you don't believe anything happens, well, then nothing much happens. That's right. But it's working. You don't believe much happens? Not much happens. <laughs> do you see this, friends? Amen. But what if you believed you spoke and it changed something? Amen. Well, your, your, the power of your words would begin to come up. We haven't been taught. We, we should have been taught this strong from the time we were understanding, say, da, da, and mama. But we weren't, because the church had lost these things. But life's not over. Huh? And there's still time. And we can, we can double time on this. And, and we can watch your words. And we can help each other. And, you know, don't, don't, don't be a confession policeman. I'm not talking about that. And bugging people all the time. But at the same point, if somebody looked at you and said, are you sure you want to say that? If you care, you might appreciate it. You might say, well, no, I don't want to say that. Thank you very much. <laughs> and you say, say the right thing because we've been so immersed in the world's way of talking. We need mind renewal. We need something checking us, making us aware of it. The Holy Spirit will do it if we'll listen to him. Can you say glory to God? Oh, thank you, Master. Thank you, Master. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Praise God. Go ahead and stand up on your feet. I've gone long enough. Mm -mm. Thank you, Lord. He said, I create the fruit of the lips. Just close your eyes and lift up your hands before the Master. Thank you, Lord. We worship you. We praise you. We glorify your holy name. Tell the Lord you believe him. Tell him you believe what's in this book. You don't care what so-called experts say. You believe him. You believe every account in this holy word. You don't have to understand and see it all. If he said it, you believe it. Lord, we trust you. We worship you. We extol you. We exalt you. We magnify your holy name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So